Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. So we're here to talk a little bit about KVM and Kimu internals. Um, but before we start on that, uh, a little bit about who I am and my background um, and you know why you might want to listen to me a little bit. Um, I'm an architect at Red Hat. Uh, I mostly work with key customers and partners to develop performance and sizing guides and reference architectures um, in conjunction with Ceph storage clusters. Uh, prior to Red Hat, um, I worked at Ink Tank, um, where I did a lot of the same thing, working with uh, customers building large storage systems. Um, and uh, prior to that, I was in operations and architecture at, at DreamHost, where I worked on uh, uh, Ceph clusters as well, bringing some of the first few into production. Um, so why, like, why did I fall down this rabbit hole of, of really trying to understand the internals of, of Kimu and the effects that it had on performance? Well, um, you know, being that I'm heavily involved in um, Ceph, and Ceph being the number one cinder driver for a number of years for production in OpenStack environments, um, talking with a lot of our customers, as they're moving their workloads onto their OpenStack clouds, um, we were beginning to be approached by them. They're asking us, um, we want to also use, continue to use that, but we want, really, we want to use it for our high performance storage too, not just to kind of our, our capacity tier or for just ephemeral booting of, of images. And if you look at the OpenStack user survey, 70% of um, the application frameworks that are being deployed in OpenStack environments are um, LAMP, LAMP-based, right? So um, making sure that MySQL performs very well is um, very, very important. And so we did a bunch of work with Percona and Supermicro um, to, and developed a reference architecture on running um, MySQL on top of RBD block devices. Um, and um, if you're interested more in that, um, there's a, a short link to that reference architect architecture paper there. But th that work is what led us, or led me, into um, really trying to understand all the different components that, that make up the Kimu subsystem. And it starts with, um, there's, there's full virtualization and there's para-virtualization. And originally, with full virtualization, um, it was nice because it had the highest com that compatibility. You didn't have to modify the guest images. Um, but the kind of the downside of it was that it was really slow, um, both in that all the, all the hardware was being emulated, the CPUs were being emulated, um, and uh, you know, very trap heavy. Um, and so the, there, there was a better way to approach this. And kind of the Kimu architecture was very simple at the time. Um, and it, it wasn't very, very high performance. Um, and not until kind of the advent of VertIO and para-virtualization drivers um, being placed in the virtual machines were we able to see a, a significantly better I.O. Um, in the guest operating systems, right? So, so now we could actually see, uh, you know, relatively good block performance. And this works by, uh, there's a VertIO bus interface between the hypervisor and then there's VertIO drivers that are um, inside um, the kernel of the virtual machine. And then that, um, that way there's a couple different methods right now. There's VertIO block paravirtualization driver and there's the VertIO SCSI paravirtualization driver. And you can choose between the two of those. Um, and the way you do that is on your glance image you can set um, properties uh, on that glance image that say, you know, for, for this particular glance image, if you instantiate an image or a, a virtual machine from it, to use uh, Vertio SCSI, for example. So as we're doing a lot of this performance testing, um, the performance testing we're doing were, was on some really kind of trick hardware. So we had brand new um, NVMe servers from Supermicro, and we had really fast uh, P3700 um, NVMEs from Intel. And we kept on seeing, we were, we were running into 
a bottleneck, and we were trying to understand what it was. And if you look back at kind of uh, uh, an older ver version of Kimu, the, the architecture looked something like this, where um, while you had the virtualizations, uh, virtualization of the, and multiple threads for um, the CPU threads, right, for, for actually executing the guest code um, natively with the hardware, uh, your I.O. was still being processed by, uh, by an event loop. And this, this event loop could block depending on the type of I.O. that was issued. To improve on things, um, this, this uh, event loop was broken up into multiple components so that it had a separate AIO context so that, so that certain IOs wouldn't have to kind of lock, um, lock this event loop um, waiting for IOs to complete. And that, that, that worked pretty well. That improved things. Um, and until a, a better method came along, and that's the, the data plane, right? And so with the data plane, you're able to have multiple threads um, of AIO contacts. And if you're doing a lot of asynchronous IO, that works pretty well. And so we're testing with all these different methods, um, with vertio block, with vertio SCSI, um, playing with the different knobs that are available um, in Kimu. Um, just, just with Kimu itself, right? With Kimu itself and RBD, um, to see what the best configurations were, even outside of OpenStack, and then we would come back to OpenStack, look at how Cinder, or look at how Nova, uh, look at how Glance interacted in, in order to then, you know, program um, the, the data plane, program uh, Kimu to, to be as performant as, as we can make it. So, bridging with OpenStack. Cinder support um, doesn't quite yet have uh, support for the Vertio block data plane. There's a blueprint up. So um, that's something that, that's, that'll be a work in progress. I was unable to find a way to use the, the, the queues and vector support um, that's available with Vertio SCSI that allows you to have multiple I.O. threads um, through Cinder. And um, I, while it could be interesting to add these things to, to Cinder, one problem that might be encountered is that if you have these separate I.O. threads that are um, going to be using a lot of CPU to, to process the I.O., um, that's going to manifest as CPU steel if it's not accounted for some way. So you would need to make, if, if we're going to start adding, if, if we were to add support to Cinder um, to allow uh, assigning multiple I.O. threads to different volumes using Verdeo SCSI, then we might need to um, have Cinder and Nova work together to account for those and, and maybe assign less vCPUs if you're using uh, effectively a, an execution thread for I.O., right? So, um, I, you know, the only primitively, I suppose, you could reserve some, some cores um, on the hypervisor, but really you would probably need a, a more holistic approach that does some sort of accounting. Um, Turns out that there's uh, also multiple different AIO modes in um, Kimu, and um, actually at the last summit, um, it was it was hard coded. You were you were only able to use a the AIO method of threads. Um, turns out that the AIO method of threads is is fairly safe, um, and how that works is um, Kimu has its own user space implementation of kind of a thread pool, and it just does. Uh, P read 64, P write 64 calls, and that was just the um, that was just hard coded in Nova. Now it's the default. Um, I believe there was a I think it was in Mataka um, that that it changed from just being hard coded to being a default, and you could actually overwrite it and use um, AIO native. Um, the difference with AIO native is that instead of using a userland thread pool, it uses uh, kernel kernel AIO in the IO submit uh, POSIX system call. And that can, that can help performance. It can bring down CPU a little bit in some cases. Um, but it, it, it's complicated. We ran tests with both, and 
for our particular workload, we didn't see um, that one performed particularly better than the other. Um, although we did see that with um, some means of benchmarking that IO submit could block and that could cause the VM to ha uh, have jitter, right? So this would, if you were running a workload in the VM and you were pushing it really, really hard, this would manifest as you would be running maybe dstat and then you would, you would see missed ticks and then it would come back and that was a little bit worrisome for us, especially you know, because we're trying to uh, use those timers for um, keeping track of how many IOs were completed in a given period. There's also a lot of different caching methods, uh, caching modes that are available um, in KVM Kimu. And um, understanding how these map, whether you're using um, just lo local LVM or um, just local drives, or if you're using RBD can be a little bit confusing. Um, so the, I, I've kind of put together this table, or I've expanded this table from, um, to include the, the RBD components, but your, the way that this works is that you can set uh, a cache mode um, in Nova, right? So in nova.conf, Nova you set your disk cache modes to write back. And that forces the cache behavior of all your VMs and center volume types to use that particular cache, which is kind of strange, uh, at least from my opinion, um, from a user experience point of view, because I, I don't want to use caching, right? From the benchmarks that I've done, not having caching turned on when you're using an all, SD, all SSD volume type uh, it is better performing than having the cache turned on at all. But for a magnetic pool, um, it's going to make a lot, lot of sense to have write back. The write back is safe. Um, if, if you have an application that, that needs to guarantee that data has been persisted to a disk, you know, it, it, it should be issu issuing an F sync and they should be using a file system that supports barriers. And if that's the case, then that'll get passed through and the, the, the RBD cache or the, the, the page cache on the host system will be flushed and it'll be on persistent media, right? So, you know, it's still beneficial um, in that it's reducing the amount of IOs that are um, going to the, the disk in terms of writes, which leaves those seeks available for, for faster reads. In an ideal world, I think that um, I, you should be able to set different cache policies based on your different volume types. So when you're an administrator and you're setting up your different volume types in Nova, I think it would, it would be really sweet if I could say um, for my gold level tier that's based on all flash media, I want to use direct sync. But on my SSD based tier um, storage type, I, I want to use write back. And Kimu lets you do that. It's just not exposed through the control plane in order to push that down, push that logic down. Um, I get asked about QoS a lot. Um, and, and, you know, Ceph itself doesn't have a native QoS capability. It's something that's being worked on, um, but it's hard uh, when you're doing distributed storage. Um, but I feel that you can do adequate you can achieve adequate QoS through uh, doing appropriate capacity planning. If, if you know the, the throughput of a particular storage node, you know its capacity, and if you collapse kind of those two constraints onto each other, similar to like they have in the public cloud, right, um, then uh, it, your, your capacity planning is you either add more because your tenants are, are uh, provisioning it for storage, spatial capacity, or for IOPS. You don't care which, right? You just need to know that you need more. So by collapsing those two constraints onto one, you don't have to independently track your IOPS and your capacity because as, a, as an operator, um, it, it, it's, just, it's just making things more complicated than it, than it needs to be. So in the testing that I've done um, and comparing um, kind of 
hard, hard drive-based pool performance and SSD-based pool performance. If anyone is familiar with the work of uh, Neil Gunther, um, he's, he wrote a great book called uh, Gorilla Capacity Planning. And um, he has a model that um, he's, he's provided, and he talks about in great detail in that book, um, called the Universal Scalability Model. And there's actually um, like tools that you can uh, use by taking data with uh, different levels of throughput and different client numbers and uh, use, uh, you know, use R to project uh, confidence bands of, of how, how much um, throughput you should expect for certain given numbers of client levels. Um, and it turns out that um, uh, part of the universal scalability law is this thing called the coherency delay. And um, the universal scalability law was originally applied to um, like, like databases and NUMA type systems, but it turns out that the coherency delay um, mat matches really well to seek latency. And so client scaling, when you have SSDs, it doesn't, it, it, it kind of plateaus because the um, seek latency is, is fixed. It's not like, um, it's not like spinning media where once you um, reach a certain once you pass a certain number of threads, you have, have this like severe retrograde performance. And so what that leads to is um, you can do the sorts of provisioning that, that we see in the public clouds. And being able to have that in Cinder, uh, being able to do capacity-derived limits for, for your, your SSD pools, where you give a ratio. So you say, for my volume type, I want to give 30 IOPS per gigabyte of storage that the tenant provisions, or I want to do three IOPS if you wanted to do something closer to like a general purpose SSD tier. Um, I, I think that makes a lot of sense for the uh, uh, all flash, all flash based. Now for the um, spinning media, I think that the static limits are great. Um, having static limits and volume quotas, I think, is perfectly sufficient for um, spinning clusters. But for uh, SSD, I, r I really think that a, a ratio approach works really well. Um, and then, like I said, uh, by collapsing the two constraints together, um, you don't care whether your tenants are um, using up capacity or IOPS. You just know that you need more. Um, and um, if you've done uh, testing beforehand on how much throughput you get from a given system, uh, you, you know whether or not you can hit those targets. And the architecture paper that I mentioned earlier, um, we, we, we actually did this so that you can kind of uh, create deterministic performance. Um, so our benchmark environment, um, I mentioned earlier, it was super micro uh, NVMe servers. We had some pretty recent uh, 2650 Haswell uh, CPUs, two of them, um, and then two Intel P3700 800 gig NVMEs, uh, dual 10 gig networking, and we were running RHEL 7.2 and um, uh, the, the previous release, not the uh, most recent release, because um, this, this work was done earlier this year, of Red Hat storage, um, which is based on the Hammer release. So this is, this is before Joule. Um, we did do some tuning, though. Um, we actually ran four OSDs per NVMe device. Um, those NVMe devices from Intel are, are pretty dang fast. And uh, you, can, you need, really need to fill the, the queue depth. So we ran actually four OSDs per NVMe device. We tuned TC Malloc um, to use larger thread cache. That's the default now, at least in the, uh, the downstream versions of um, Ceph. The other things that were important were um, TCP, no delay, um, basically disable the congestion control um, so that you can have, um, uh, you, you don't have to worry about that with your, you know, it keeps the latency down. And then also, uh, really critical when you're running any sort of NVMe is uh, making sure that your kernel supports block MQ, which is uh, so that you can have multiple queues into the NVMe device. 
so at first when we were doing the testing in these KVM um, instances, we were using FIO with ODirect. We were F-syncing after each write um, using the libAIO AIO engine and using ext4 inside the guest. Um, and this is, this is when we encountered the issues with uh, jitter and the missed ticks. And um, we weren't quite sure that FIO, the FIO accounting was, uh, we weren't super confident in the, um, the IOPS figures because we didn't know if the, the, the stalls um, that were being caused um, by the jitter were affecting the calculations on how many IOPS were being done per second. So um, we think, uh, in retrospect, and after learning a little bit more, it might be due to o using ODirect and the a using AIO native, um, which happens to not be the default in OpenStack. So you know, maybe if we were running it in a OpenStack environment and not playing around with things, we might not have seen this, um, and, and potentially IO submit blocking. But regardless. Um, so we, we also wanted to, you know, that was kind of the lower level testing, but the uh, eventual goal was to do MySQL benchmarking. And so we brushed off kind of um, sysbench, right? And uh, we set up, a, set up a config where we had a 50 gig buffer pool, uh, 8 gig inodb, uh, made sure it was, you know, a, a fully ACID compliant configuration. Uh, inodb, odirect, um, flushing after every transaction. Uh, the guest file system was XFS. Um, we used no A time, no door A time. Um, we accidentally used no barrier, which is a terrible idea, so don't do that. Um, but um, don't only, um, as far as the effect on the results, um, that probably would only affect the results where uh, write back cache uh, wasn't enabled and we actually had better performance when it wasn't enabled. So um, I, again, um, do not use no barrier ever. Um, that was just kind of a mistake. So uh, we reloaded the data um, before each test and then we um, did two different tests. We did 100% read workload um, just doing selects, and then we did 100% write workload, where we were just doing updates. And then we did a blended workload, where we were doing 70-30 reads and writes. And um, we made sure that we were using a, uh, a uniform distribution, so this wasn't a parallel distribution, because we wanted to have a, a good amount of the I.O. hitting the disk. We didn't want everything coming out of the buffer pool, because that's not really testing the storage. Uh, ran it for 20 minutes, and uh, so what were the results? Well, as you can see, kind of the the original default fully virtualized is very slow. Um, that's that's all the way on the left here. Uh, the defaults um, just kind of out of the box. Um, you can see that on. Uh, you know, we were doing pretty good on reads, just shy of, of 200,000 IOPS for that particular instance. Um, reads, uh, I mean, the, both the writes and the reads and writes were over 5,000. Um, when we set the cache to none, um, um, the, the final two uh, charts um, here um, were with the threads and native, you can see that um, th there wasn't much of a performance difference, especially if um, you know we had uh, factored error bars um, into into these graphs. There would probably it would probably be statistically insignificant difference. Um, as far as cache modes go, um, you can see that the highest performance was with the cache turned off, right? So with the cache turned off on an all SSD based cluster. Um, you saw a lot better performance. And so if you were already running a cluster and you had gone into your nova.conf and set your caching method to write back because you know, your initial deployment was a bunch of spinning media and then you added a high performance tier um, because of that inability to have that flexibility in terms of a, a different cache configuration for a different volume type, you'd be 
uh, sacrificing a decent amount of performance. Uh, we didn't see very much of an increase by using dedicated dispatch threads. That's where you can actually have a, a completely separate I.O. thread. Um, and I, I, I think that it, if, if I go back and then I run back through these, you're, you're probably seeing a common theme here in that writes are really stellar. Or I mean, reads are really stellar, but writes are, are low, but more, more interesting is the fact that our mixed read-write workloads is never, is almost always the same as our write workload. So this is, this is, this is where we're beginning to suspect the, the, the Kimu lock, right? So when, when we know that we have synchronous writes that are blocking the, the I.O. event loop, the I.O. thread, um, the, the subsequent reads are just waiting for that to come back. And so, it, any, I mean, any realistic workload is going to be mixed. And so when you're, you're, you're doing all those little inodb log updates and you're synchro synchronously issuing f-syncs to them and you have async, you know, asynchronous accesses for uh, inodb pages to, to pull them in to answer updates, or I mean answer selects, those, those are going to be held up. So this was, this was surprising to us. We didn't, we didn't think that this was um, uh, something that we would see. Um, we even tried increasing the queues um, by using Verdeo SCSI. Um, and we did see, you know, much better performance on writes. In fact, we were able to get over 35,000 IOPS to, um, from an RBD inside of a guest. But that's 100% a, that's a read workload. So the, the having additional I.O. threads um, and being able to asynchronously access or, or do reads uh, uh, it was scaling, was increasing, um, but, but still, uh, for, as soon as we had a mixed workload where there was synchronous writes going on, um, that, was the, that was the limiting factor. So we went back and we ran the same tests on bare metal with just the kernel, kernel RBD driver. And then we ran kernel RBD put a file system on it and passed it through to a container. Um, and you'll see something interesting in that the, the mixed read-write workload all of a sudden is not, not getting blocked. And the only difference here is that we're not going through the, the, key, the Kimu I.O. subsystem. So kind of in conclusions, the, our, our performance is, is pretty good, right? Like there, there's been a lot of work that's been go, put into Kimu to make it perform really well. Um, we're, we're able to, um, at least on a 100% read workload, hit the caps that are similar to what the public clouds do, right? So the public clouds cap out their instances at 20,000 or 25,000 IOPS. They, you, can't, you can't do more than that. And in some cases, you know, we're demonstrating, um, what, over 30,000, close to 40,000 IOPS, at least on read. I mean, I mean that's, that's, you know, still pretty impressive for a single instance. Um, I think the UX is kind of weird for a pair of virtualization devices that you have to set properties on your glance images. Um, I, I, I think that if you look at, like, how Google Compute Engine works, um, they only do Vertio SCSI. I, 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 I think that it would be really neat if I could say, hey, I want, I want to always use Vertio SCSI for all the instances that are booted as a cloud. That'll just be an operator decision. I, I don't think many tenants really understand the difference between Vertio Block, Vertio SCSI, and which one is more appropriate for them, and that they're going to ch choose the, you know, set and have, maintain separate glance images, like am I going to have the rel vertio block and the rel vertio SCSI separate glance images with different properties so that I can, I, no, I'm probably just going to use one, right? Um, so I thought that was a little awkward. Um, 
the OpenStack cache configuration is, is not very flexible right now. Um, and the impact on multiple volume types uh, doesn't, uh, was, didn't seem to be considered, um, uh, you know, and I think that's just kind of the organic way that, that, that it's grown, right? Um, it, it used to be perfectly sensible, um, you know, uh, when, it was, when it was Nova and just Nova volume. And I, it, we've, we've outgrown that and we probably just need to adjust to that. Uh, the big Kimu lock uh, limits mixed workloads where you have IO direct and uh, synchronous writes. Uh, this is particularly evident in uh, inodb type workloads like we're uh, showing here with Sysbench. Um, the AIO and data plane uh, multi queue does probably help other workloads a lot particularly if they're um, uh, mostly asynchronous. Um, but, you know, in the case of databases, um, I, I think um, we're being held back a little bit. So w w what would I test next? What, what do I want to test next? Um, I want to try uh, using Vert.io SCSI, and um, there's, there's a way inside um, to, to, when you're, you're booting the instance to tell it to use uh, block MQ for the uh, Vert.io SCSI device. And then if you have multiple, um, multiple uh, IO queues uh, or I, IO threads and vectors for your Vert.io SCSI device, uh, we might be able to see um, some better parallelization there. Um, one thing that I, I, I recently found out about is uh, this thing called vhost SCSI. And um, what it does is instead of, use, instead of using the IO subsystem, it actually um, uses, it, it, it goes back to LIO in the kernel and uses the kernel for processing the IO. Um, and and it, it turns out that there's some work being done with KRBD and integrating it with LIO. So there, there may be a way to potentially leverage um, that work and vhost SCSI to, to, to bypass kind of the, the Kimu backend, um, you know, with the user land libRBD and just use the kernel implementation of KRBD um, and not have to do it inside the guest, right? Because um, we don't want to expose the storage network to the tenant networks, but to, to have that back Kimu and, and maybe see um, if, if we're able to get the, the performance levels that we saw here on, on the metal and in the containers um, in, in Kimu. And then, uh, you know, if, if this does work, um, what are the impacts on live migration? Um, are, because the uh, kernel CPU, uh, uh, because the kernel is going to be con consuming CPU with these uh, all these kernel threads, is that going to show up? Like if there's a lot of guest I.O. processing, is that going to manifest as CPU steal um, for, the, for, for the guest oh, guests? And then finally, this is something that um, uh, is, is, is pretty cool. Um, uh, it was done this summer. Um, uh, there's the MyRox, which is a, a version of MySQL written by Facebook. It uses uh, RocksDB instead of InnoDB as the back end. Um, an intern at Red Hat over the summer uh, made it so that RocksDB can store um, its write ahead log and its pages directly into Rados. Um, so you could potentially run a MySQL database without a block device or a file system at all. It would just be talking to a, a mutable object store. And so you could completely eliminate the double write buffer because Radius is already ensuring uh, atomic updates because it has to be able to support rollbacks anyways. Um, so that's, that could be interesting. So that's all I have um, for today. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, and if anyone has any questions.
yeah, I, I, uh, the question was, um, so what is the answer when you, when you want to have different volume types with, with different cache modes? Um, is there a way to do it with, with different host groups or, or regions? Um, uh, that's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, when it comes to Virtio SCSI over Virtio BLK, when it comes to guest driver support or any settings which needs to be done in guest OS, or is that change is completely like invisible for the guest? If we typical guest OS distributions, not only Red Hat but others. Um, that's a good question. Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I think most guests yeah. support so, Vertio SCSI. Yeah, yeah, VDA, VDA yeah. to SDA. Uh, SDA, but SDA is supposed to be the, the normal SCSI, not virtual SCSI. Uh, okay, uh, but maybe, maybe you have tested. Is it true that the device name at least changes? Yeah, I, I thought that it will remain the same because SDA is bare metal SCSI, not virtual SCSI. Uh, Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Great, thank you.